All right, so this delta that we've got is going to be the source of a new notation for our derivative. And it's just it's something that's going to come up left and right today uh, a little bit later. So I want to just tack it on to the end of this review of our definitions of derivatives. So delta, pronounced delta, that's the Greek letter, delta. Um, like the flight company, the airplane company, right, delta, airlines. It means change in mathematically. So if I said to you, you know, what does this delta x mean? It means change in x. If I said delta temp, it would mean change in temp, as in temperature. And we all know it's falling. So change in temperature. Maybe something we're looking forward to, maybe not. But delta. Are we good with that new symbol? Delta? Okay. We can describe derivatives with deltas all over the place, right? Here I see a delta f up top. That's a change in our function f as you go from x to a. And that's divided by a change in x. A little change in x, right? H is a little change that goes to nothing. And here we have another change in our function. Slopes are just a change in height divided by a change in run, right? width. So it's not surprising that we can write this limit notation like so, the limit as delta x goes to 0, and then the appropriate thing here. But we'll get to that later when we need it. OK? So this will be, if you want to leave space in your notes, there's going to be a new fraction later. Uh, don't write this, but I. Right at the end, we learn this sweet new theorem which says, hello, good morning, come on in. For any <laughs> integer n, the derivative with respect to x of x to the nth power is just n times x to the n minus 1. That was the key finding that we found there at the end. And I'm just going to jump to the chase here. It actually can be a bit more general than this. It doesn't need to just be an integer or a natural number. We can actually pick any real number. And that's supposed to be an R. This is what you have. There's a special case when n is 0. So we'll just do a couple examples. And, and this, is, this is just one of those really nice patterns uh, with derivatives. It keeps you from having to do this process over and over again. So easiest example, n equals 0. What's the derivative of x to the 0? Well, x to the 0 is is what? 1. That's a constant 1. What's the derivative of any constant? Or you could think of it as 0 times x to the negative 1, which is 0. OK, what about x to the 72nd? We take that derivative. Sure. It's just. 72 times x to the 72 minus 1. <laughs> All right. Questions about this? This was just the really nice consequence of taking derivatives in sort of a, an abstract case last time and proving that it's just this. We've done it once. We've now done it for all time. Have a polynomial term and you're taking its derivative, you just 
do this now. This is really handy when you're taking up derivatives of polynomials in general because we also know what happens when we take derivatives of sums, I think, right? <laughs> derivative of f plus g, so we take two functions and we add them together, both of those are functions of x. If we take two differentiable functions, add them together, I might, I should add that, two functions that were not differentiable. Um, couldn't do this. This is just the derivative of f plus the derivative of g. So we're going to prove this in, in just a minute, but first I wanted to also ask, what's a function that's not differentiable? What does that even mean as a term? A function is not differentiable. We've looked at polynomials, we've looked, we've looked at constants, we've looked now at just power functions. First, conceptually, what does it mean? If a function is not differentiable. So when we think about this, right, we start with the function. In order to find its derivative, in order to differentiate it, that's what that is. Find this derivative, we write down this fraction. Okay, That might cause some problems, depending on how we write it. Maybe the function doesn't exist at x plus h. Maybe it doesn't exist at exactly x. Maybe it doesn't exist at exactly a. There can be some issues in writing down this fraction. And so from the beginning, we talked about limits, right? Where x was going to a, and we said, around this, our function needs to be defined in a small little area around that. So let's, let's just throw that aside for a minute. We'll say we have our functions defined nearby this limiting value, and we'll, we'll sort of disregard that. What would it mean, then, if a function is not differentiable well, it would mean that when we go through this process of the fraction which we, we can certainly write down, it means going through this process does not give us a nice pattern result. In other words, the process gives you something that can't happen or doesn't exist or is intractable. I'll write this down in words. A function f has no derivative um, at a. So it just means this IE is not differentiable. if the limit of x going to a of f of x minus f of a, uh, x minus a, does not exist. So like I said, we've only worked really with, with nice kinds of functions, functions that are, quote, smooth functions that you can easily find the slope of, the secant line, and then take 
this limiting process and that slope of the secant lines is, is kind of very patterned. But there's a whole multitude of functions where that's not the case. And it's not difficult to come up with them. Um, you've seen some of them already. Sine of 1 over x, for example. You can, you can pretty much think of any limit that does not exist and then try to fit a function to that. You can come up with something that's not differentiable there. You okay with this? Just sort of an aside to get back to this. So we need to start with differentiable functions to begin with. If we're going to hope to take a derivative of a sum of functions. So we take two differentiable functions, functions for which we can find that limit. And the derivative of their sum is equal to the sum of their derivatives, is what this sum law says. <coughs> okay, so let's go ahead and prove this. <coughs> We're going to start with two differentiable functions, which means this, the limit as x goes to a, of f of x minus f of a over x minus a exists, and the limit as x goes to a of g of x minus g of a over x minus a exists. This is equal to f prime this is g prime. We know those two things exist. So what about this? Let's go ahead and write it down, right? It's the limit as x goes to a of f plus g of x minus f plus g at a all over x minus a. That's an a, not a 9. And by definition of the sum of functions, this is just the limit as x goes to a of f of x plus g of x minus f of a plus g of a all over x minus a. And when we've got fractions like this, a sum or a difference in the numerator, one denominator. We can just split it up into two fractions with the same denominator. Right? 4 over 2 is 2. 3 halves plus a half is 4 halves, which is 2. So what you need is that property of numbers now. After rearranging some things, we need to distribute the negative sign to each of these, bring the half of a over, the g of x over. There. Which gives us this. Rearranging the top, just commuting them. It's a commuted property of addition and subtraction. If you carry the subtraction signs appropriately. And these two guys are on top, both divided by that. So using that property of numbers, we're going to write this one fraction of x minus a as two fractions of x minus a. And we're going to apply now because we know both of those limits exist, right? Both those limits exist. We're going to apply our sum law for the limit, which says if you've got two functions added together and you take a limit, that's equal to the limit of, the, of each individual one added together. are the derivatives, and that's what we wanted to show anyway. The derivative of the sum is equal to the sum of the derivatives, and that's what we've got right here. F prime plus g prime.
means now you can take the derivative of any polynomial with the two theorems that we just discussed. This is just a sum and difference of things you know how to take derivatives of. Here's f of x, here's g of x, here's h of x. The derivative of the sum is just the sum of the derivatives, according to that theorem. And these are all just polynomial terms, power terms. And you can find their derivatives by multiplying in front by their powers. And subtracting 1. Once and for all, we found how to find their derivatives. Questions <coughs> on this so far before I move on? Yes, please. Uh, if there's a, a coefficient in front of one of the terms on the polynomial, like it was 6x to the fourth, that doesn't impact the derivative of it, right? Great question. Fantastic question. Um, does impact it in some way. Make a claim. Derivative of a constant times x to the n is equal to what? Make a claim before I start writing limits and we all go crazy. The derivative of a constant is zero. It is, yeah. So would that just... No, nice, that's okay, yes, you're, yes. If we had a constant plus x to the n, it would be zero plus x to the n. Okay, let's write down the limits. This is proof of something we don't yet know. So here we go, we're going to discover what it is. We know this limit exists, right? If we take this... We know that exists, and we know that that is equal to this. Right? Okay, here we go. We'll take the derivative of that now. We're going to write down the limit. in the quotient here. <clears throat> okay, so it's going to be f of x minus f at a. Right? What is our function to begin with? It's this guy. minus that, that's f hat a, all divided by x minus a. I notice up top they've got a common factor, c. So we can factor that out. the limit law where if you've got the limit of a constant times something, what can you do with that constant in terms of the limit, like taking that limit? Do you remember? You can factor it out as the limit itself. In that process of making the table, how would you find this value? You would plug things into x and evaluate, right? So. This c times the top, in that process, what you would really be doing is doing this, 
then multiply by c and write it down. Do this, then multiply by c and write it down. But in that process, the whole table, what if you just made a table which was these things? You found the pattern in those things. Every single one of them, you can multiply by c. So the end result, you can also just multiply by c. You find the pattern in the process for this, you multiply that by c, you still have it. So this is c times the limit as x goes to a of x to the n minus a to the n over x minus a. What's this? or a difference of things to take derivatives of, and we know what to do with that. We take derivatives of each piece. So this is the derivative of the first one plus the derivative of the second one minus the derivative of the next one plus the derivative of the last thing. This Right here tells us anything that has a constant multiplied by it can just be done by factoring out the constant first. So constant multiplied by x to the fourth, constant multiplied by x to the third, nothing and just a constant there. So this is 5 times the derivative of x to the fourth. This is 3 times the derivative of x cubed. We're not going to worry about these we can just evaluate them right now, because there's no constants to pull out. Derivative of x to the first is 1x to the 0, 1 minus 1. Derivative of any constant is 0. So yes, it does actually create some impact. It just has the effect of you just multiply by the power still. So I can write that here. times 2 times 1. Oh, cool. Now you know how to 
define a factorial in terms of derivatives. Derivatives, excuse me. Four factorial is how that's said. Four. It's used all the time in combinatorics or the, the science of counting things, which, by the way, is probably one of the hardest mathematical ventures of counting things. I say that in all seriousness. Four factorial means take this number, multiply it by one less, and then by one less, and then by one less, and then by one less until you get down to one, and then stop. Okay, so, for example, 10 factorial is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Stop. It's a massive number. That's the number of ways you can rearrange 10 different objects in different spots. I gave you, if I took 10 of you, from here and I said, arrange yourselves here in all the possible ways. How many possible ways could you arrange yourselves if you were, there were 10 of you? That many ways. It's a crazy big number. Crazy big. Which is not, you know, a big number to start with. 10. So counting things gets really difficult really fast because things just blow up. So in our catalog of derivatives that we know how to find, so far we've got powers, x to the n. We've got sums of powers, polynomials. Maybe we should add something else then. Some variety. It's a spice of life, right? So maybe we'll go to like the next easiest one, which is. Do you have a preference? Like, what is the easiest thing after polynomials? It's all hard after. I know, right? Right? Even polynomials. Like, we're choosing low power. What if I give you, like, to the thousand power? Like, even computing something like that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Okay. Trig functions? No, no one wants to do those next. They're definitely not the easiest ones because they're transcendental. They transcend the easy stuff to the hard stuff, right? Okay. Um, rational functions? Quotients of polynomials? Say no. No, right, they're also very difficult. Very difficult. <laughs> Exponentials? Say yes. Yes, oh, perfect. Yeah, they're, they're actually probably the next easiest one. <laughs> so we're going to do those, okay? And then we're going to come back to, in section 3.2, how to find derivatives of products of things and quotients of things. And that's actually the harder stuff. And um, that involves rational functions. And that involves all sorts of odd functions you can create by multiplication. So, oh, and even functions you can obtain through multiplication. But uh, that's where we're headed next, OK? Exponentials. You ready? We need to like brain break. We OK? There's been a lot of theorems today. I'm sorry. It's very abstract. But these are like the general patterns, OK? So you can take derivatives of sums of things by just taking the sums of the derivatives. And we can just take derivatives of constants times a thing by just taking the derivative of the thing and multiplying by the constant. If we have a power, we just multiply by the power and subtract one from the power, and that's the derivative. These are the patterns so that you never again have to do those limits. 
So let's move on to the next one. Exponentials. Let's, before getting into that, we'll just recall an exponential. Function is of the form some number times a base raised to the x power. There's some common ones that we have, right? We've got the binary. We've got the natural exponential. And we've got the one that we all know and love and use every single day behind the scenes, just the tenth the exponential. These are all just exponential functions. You've got a fixed base uh, that's positive and not equal to 1, and you just raise it to some variable power. Sometimes you have a coefficient multiplied in front, um, sometimes not. We're going to deal with these cases because we all know what to do if there's a constant here when taking a derivative, we just forget it and then reintroduce it at the end through multiplication. So my question is, what is the derivative of e to the x at zero? After that, my question will be, what is the derivative of e to the x, period? Okay. I've lost count. How do we initially start with any derivative? We write down this limit, and then there's multiple things we can write down underneath the limit. Do you want to use the h going to zero one? Okay. What's next? Oh, I got equals on. Don't put equals on. Here we put usually f of x plus h, right? But if we're evaluating it this at this at zero, we can put zero there. After we do this, we put x f of x there, we divide by h. So in terms of our original function, this is just the limit as h goes to zero of e to the x plus h minus e to the x all over h. But we're doing this at zero, right? x equals zero. So these x's are zeros. Which simplifies down quite a bit, actually, to just this e to the h minus 1 over h. Who has a ridiculously good memory? Like a really good memory. I saw one hand go up. 
That's okay, I'm sure you just forgot that you have a good memory. Um, what is this number? Because this is just a number, right? This is a process, we're going to take h, send it to zero. There's no variables in here anymore. So this is just a number. A long time ago, I gave us this number. I said this natural exponential is the only function to have this property. This is 1. Long time ago, I said this. And I don't know if I worked it out through the tables, but you could confirm it. Just go through this process, h e to the h minus 1 over h. We're going to 0, so negative point, um, 0 0.01 or point 0.1, negative point 0.01 negative 0.001, and then do it from the right as well, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, etc. You would find that this gets closer and closer to 1. Okay, so this is the derivative of e to the x at x equals 0. I have a question. Yes. Um, usually when we take the derivative, we substitute h for 0 at some point. At some point, uh -huh. How would that work if you put e to the 0, wouldn't that equal 1? You tell me. e to the 0. Take a number, raise it to the zeroth power, that gives you one. Last class, I said if you come up with something like this when you plug in, mm -hmm. what do you know you can't do now? You can't apply it. You know you can't plug it. Very good. You're always welcome to try. Yes. As soon as you see this, you need to stop. And then, like, everything over here, Erase. What do you do then? Bingo. The process. So what I'm saying down here is, well, I didn't plug it in. So what I'm saying here is, you can't plug it in. We need to go to the process, and you would eventually come to that after a few computations. Very good question. Very good. Others? No? easiest function to differentiate. <coughs> Polynomial is super easy. Here's the second one. This is the definition that we'll start with. We're going to go right away to this, but we're not going to plug in zeros. Okay, so that derivative is this limit is h goes to nothing of e to the x plus h minus e to the x all divided by h. That's just the definition we know and love. Do you guys see any common factors? I do. Tell me, if you've got a number like this, is there another way you can write that? Maybe kind of how? E to the x. E to the x. Perfect. So in, in, in general, a to the b times a to the c. So here, e to the x times e to the h. And there's a common factor, e to the x.
So that factor E V X, does it depend on the value of H? I don't see any variables H in that formula, E to the X, right? This has nothing to do with H. So we treat it like it's a constant. Because it is a constant. We change H, this stays the same, this is the only thing that changes. So this is a constant in terms of H. Which means we can factor it out. And what's that then? Oh, four. One! Oh. Wow! I almost, you know, had I right justified this, it would have been more obvious. That's e to the x times one. Stop and step back a little bit. You might scratch your head and ask, wait a minute, what did we even do? The answer is you did nothing. Well, I did nothing, sorry. You, you were good sports. You came along for the right. But we just wrote in a circle here. Take the derivative of e to the x, and what is it? e to the x, great. Maybe even easier than polynomials, right? Maybe. Except for this little bit right here. This is fantastic. I'm sorry, but we're going to stop <coughs> taking derivatives of exponentials now. We're not going to do these. Um, do you remember that change of base formula? From a while back, change of base formula for logarithms? Yeah? If you remember that, I claim you can take the derivatives of these at will. We're going to do those in a bit, but we're going to do that after we learn about another rule in a couple of sections called the chain rule. I'm going to stop. Questions? E of the X? In summary, I mean, now we can take the derivative of the natural exponential. We can take the derivatives of any polynomial using these patterns. And there's a whole multitude of other functions we can take derivatives of if we default to the table method, process method, but functions for which we have rules, patterns is actually quite small at the moment. So now we're going to introduce a way to come up with rules for more functions, and this is in section 3.2. It's called product and quotient laws for derivatives. One of the inventors of calculus from a long time ago, Sir Goldfried Leibniz, he put forth a hypothesis that was wrong. When investigating this question, if you've got two functions that you're going to differentiate, but these functions are multiplied together, not added, not subtracted, they're multiplied together, what's, what is the derivative of that? product. So the first inventor actually answered this incorrectly. Okay. And it's not too difficult to come up with counterexamples. So we're going to, I'm actually just going to show you that. He guessed incorrectly that it was f prime of x times g prime of x. Okay. It wasn't too shortly after that someone said, okay.
what's x times x? That's supposed to be a g. What's x times x? Well, that's x squared. What's the derivative of f? What's the derivative of g? And what's the derivative of f times g? Powers 1, powers 1, powers 2. We know what to do with these things. Multiply by the power, subtract 1 from the power. x to the 0 is just 1, so this is just 1. 1 times 1 is 1. But this product is x squared. What's the derivative of that? 2, x to the first. Is that always 1? Depends on what x is. At x equals one half, it's one. Leibniz always gets a bad rap, by the way. Always. I don't know. He was just a hopeful man, an optimist, perhaps. The credit for most of this is given to someone else. How can we intuit or think of the correct product rule? Well, it comes back to that little delta that I talked about earlier. Delta, remember, delta means a little change in. So, we can talk about changes in functions. All right, let's say that u is our function f of x, so just like a substitutionary title. And so a change in that function value would be like, a change in our function would be like, you plug in two numbers that are pretty close and you just take the difference. So it's a change in our function x. A change in our function f, perhaps. This h oftentimes is also written differently. It's written using this delta, so I'm going to write that here. x plus a little change in x. And the symbols are just starting to explode here. Let's also write something down for the other function that we're considering. So v is going to be essentially our substitutionary variables. U and V literally mean we're going to take our function evaluated at different values of X, and we're going to say that that difference is our function U, so a change in that U is something like this. Are we clear so far where all this notation is coming from? Yes? Why is it necessary to create a substitutionary name for the function? It's just a simplified thing. We don't need to. I mean, I could not have written these down, and we could proceed from there. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it just makes... Mm, it's kind of like factoring polynomials. You know, polynomial is nice. It's a big, long sum of mm -hmm. things. But we can also, quote, simplify it by factoring it. Okay. 
and that sometimes results in more succinct writing of things. <clears throat> so from here on, wherever I want to write this, which is quite a lot to be honest, I draw a triangle and U. And that, I draw a triangle and V. Great question. Yeah. Other questions so far? Okay, so like looking down the road, looking at where we're going, derivatives are changes divided by changes, right? We're taking limits as those changes go to nothing. I showed you at the very beginning we're going to let delta x go to nothing in our limit. So that's where this is going. And changes divided by changes, we're talking about changes in functions here. So this is sort of setting up the groundwork for taking a derivative here in the end. Um, which of course is what we want. We want to know what this derivative is. Okay. So now let's talk about this. draw this up here for us. In this product, now, we're looking for the change in the product. Before we knew what they were for just the change in u, for the change in v, we're taking f of x plus delta x minus f of x. We're taking g of x plus delta x. We're subtracting g of x. So, this is kind of like taking right, f uh, of a little change minus f of something with no change in it. Right? We can interpret this in terms of actually this rectangle that I've got written here. So, kind of like this x and delta x. So, on the, yeah, sure, on the left, I'll do a little bit of u and u. So, this length is u plus a little change in u. Up on top we've got for width, we've got original v and a little bit of a change in v. We can fill out this whole thing sort of as an area And we can see straight away why Leibniz got his problem wrong. Leibniz was guessing that we could just take derivatives of each of an individual piece. But when you start working with differences of things where something has changed by a small amount, you don't just have the product of the two original things. You've got all these extra terms that come out. Right? Derivatives are fractions where you are taking differences and then multiplying these differences together. So there's all of these other terms when you expand this, uh, this, this polynomial out. So this is a piece, perhaps, but not the entire story. Okay. So what is this delta u times v? Well, it has the same form as these, right? We're going to take what we have here, and then we're going to be subtracting the original things. Okay, so what do we have over there? It's this u plus delta v, delta u times v plus delta v minus u times v. Okay. 
Okay. I'm terrified to ask, but questions? Too many? Where's all this Delta stuff coming from, right? Leave this all clarified. We're taking our function, and in the limit definition with h, we're plugging in x plus h. And then we're plugging in just x, and we're dividing by h, right? h is just something that goes to zero, so why not just call that a little change in our input? how far off we are from the original input x is just delta x. We're going to say well, that goes to nothing. Instead of just saying h, it now has some interpretation. When you plug in this x plus h to, these, to this product, you're going to get something like this that expands out. In the definition of the limit, you have the subtraction of the original product. So we're almost there, actually, in this. What do we just need to divide by in order to have our limit that we want to take? We just need delta x. You compare the form of this to the form here. We just need this little delta x. There's this conceptual idea here that's sort of underlying this all. Why do, we, why do we write df divided by dx when we're talking about the derivative? Where does this d come from? Well, this is, again, just the limit of a little change in our function divided by a little change in our input. This is as the, the change goes to nothing. Right, so now we've computed this delta f, where the f is our product. U, V, U, delta V, V, delta U, delta U, delta V, minus U, V, all over delta X. We just need to divide by this delta X and we've got ourselves the definition of derivative. sum of limits, we can take the limit of the sum now. Or this is a 
limit of a sum, now we can take the sum of limits and set that backward. U does not depend on delta x except uh, the delta U depends on delta x. U does not. Neither does V. Delta V does. So these guys can be taken out front. Back to our original definitions of delta V and delta U. This first one here, delta V over delta X. Delta V, G of X plus delta X minus G of X. If I divide this by delta X and send delta X to zero, that gives me G prime. So this is U times G prime of X. What is U? U is just a substitutionary name for X. And this differential thing just did this difference between the two values of that. If there's no difference to be had, what is U? It's just that. delta on that, V is just a substitutionary name for G. Delta V is just this process of taking a difference of G's values at slightly different inputs. So V becomes just G of X. And what's delta U? Delta U is this difference of X divided by now, delta X and the limit of that delta X going to nothing. That's F prime. Now the kicker, what is this end term? Can we evaluate each piece individually? That's a good question, right? What's this right factor as you take the length? And can you evaluate it? In the limit, this becomes down just a second ago. The derivative of G. If we wrote down what this was, it would be G of X plus delta X minus G of X divided by delta X. Taking the limit as that delta X goes to nothing, that's the definition of the derivative of it. So we can find this one individually. Can we find this one individually? If delta x goes to nothing, what does this difference become? Zero. We're plugging in numbers closer and closer to each other. Eventually, they're going to become the same number. So we can evaluate both individually which means the product law for limits applies, which means we can take the limit of each individually and then multiply them, which means this last term is just zero overall. So Leibniz was wrong. Moral of the story, you can't just differentiate each piece and then multiply. It does not give you the correct result except in very specific circumstances. What you have to do instead is take the derivative of the first one, multiply it by the second one. Then add the derivative of the second one 
times the first one. This is called the product law, the derivatives, and it opens up a huge category of new functions that we can easily take derivatives of. Can I erase the middle column, for example? multiply this out, use the laws you've already found. But if one of these two had like seven terms in it, there's no way you want to waste your time multiplying those out. There's an easier way. What we can do instead is take the derivative of x minus 5 prime, multiply that by x squared plus 2, add that to x minus 5 times the derivative of x squared plus 2. The derivative of x minus 5 is very simple. Right? Take the derivative of 5, that's nothing. Take the derivative of x, that's 1. Times x squared plus 2, so this becomes just x squared plus 2. x minus 5 remains the same. What's the derivative? of x squared plus 2, well that's 2x to the first plus nothing. So it's times 2x. So the end result is x squared plus 2x squared plus 3x squared minus 10x plus 2. Don't need to multiply anything out. Much easier to do than just boiling it all out and going, even in the simplest case. But in the harder cases, even. This really makes our jobs a lot easier. out is e to the x times x to the fifth plus 3x squared e to the x minus e to the x and you wouldn't have a clue, right? You can't apply the power law because you've got e to the x multiplied by the polynomial terms. So that's out the window. But this law definitely applies. I see a function e to the x. I see a function x to the fifth plus 3x squared minus 1. To find the derivative of this, I take the derivative of the first piece and just multiply it by the second piece. I add that to the first piece times the derivative of the second piece. And each of those are terribly easy to remember on their own. What is the derivative of e to the x? Thank you, e to the x. Derivative of x to the fifth. Not to the fifth? Sorry, I misheard you. Derivative of 3x squared. We shouldn't be doing this yet, should we? We're going to keep going. Derivative above negative 1. We did them in the opposite order. Thank you, e to the x. Had I picked any different function, this would not have been this nice. That's it. That's the derivative. Derivative above the so the first function times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first function times the second. So you just leave it like that? Yeah, you know, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. You could factor out e to the x, combine like terms. It would be this.
Okay? That's it. Before you run off. I need to apologize, I was remiss. I didn't put up your section 3.1 homework last week. I just put it up this morning. It is still due Thursday night at midnight. But that's the only section we're going to have a quiz on this Friday. I'm going to go put up section 3.2 homework, which was supposed to also be on the quiz Friday. That's going to be due next week, Thursday, along with the other section. Okay? Next time we're going to talk about the quotient rule, which opens up even more things to work with. So, see you then.